graffiti, as the name itself, is not an art. Graffiti is the application of a medium to a surface. I will show you graffiti, such as the letters on the end of that car directly in back of me. Is that an art form? I don't know. I'm not an art cr critic. But I can sure as hell tell you that that's a crime. There's a rather interesting niche of gaming that intersects hip hop culture and it has produced some very interesting and mixed results. We can see this from obscure titles like Ram Jam Volume 1 and Wu-Tang Shaolin Style to more prominent games and franchises like 50 Cent's Bulletproof and Blood in the Sand, the Def Jam Fighting Games, and the NBA Street Series. There's always been a desire to ingratiate urban street culture into the gaming landscape. In 2006, Atari released Mark Echo's Getting Up, Contents Under Pressure, a story-driven action-adventure title centered around graffiti and street culture on the PlayStation 2 and Xbox home consoles. Mark Echo created Echo Unlimited in 1983 and built it up as a staple in the hip-hop, urban streetwear, and skate cultures. You'd see the brand at every major retailer, in magazines, sponsoring events, and just playing being about the culture. It was truly to my surprise that while doing research for this video, I learned that the company was actually in dire straits due to tumultuous legal troubles and financial mismanagement, putting the company in a very precarious spot. All the while, Echo was in conceptual stages for an animated piece that got put on hold and it eventually became the framework for getting up. He started making connections in the gaming industry and linked up with Atari and The Collective, who almost exclusively worked on licensed products. They've got games like Men in Black, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Indiana Jones games, and Star Wars Revenge of the Sith on their <laughs> collective resume. The game and the Echo brand received a huge boost from a very early viral ad in 2006 when a video was released of Echo hopping a fence and supposedly tagging Air Force One, riding still free on the side on the turbo engine. Remember that phrase, it's going to come up again later. The video received a ton of press in traditional media and authorities scrambled to investigate the authenticity of the video. In retrospect, it couldn't have been anything but fake. <laughs> There's no conceivable way anyone could have actually pulled that off in a recently post 9-11 America. The game received average reviews, with aggregators scoring it about 70% across all platforms of release. Game Informer gave it a 7.5 out of 10, and GamePro a 2.5 out of 10, and GameSpot gave it a respectable 8.7 out of 10. From the info I've gleaned, it seems the relationship between Echo and Atari slash The Collective was rocky at best. It seems Echo wasn't particularly happy with the end product, and he's been very vocal about that in the past. It seems like more than anything, he wanted a truthful and realistic representation of the culture, and the results were coming out a bit more gamey than he liked. Can't find citations for these quotes, but he apparently described some of the hardships of the game's development. The gaming community has a natural tendency to take anything cool and make it cartoonish. That was a big learning curve. And frankly, he has a decent point. The general motif for a large swath of the gaming sphere of the time was exactly as he's describing. It is only when gaming started to mature and evolve into the high budget visual storytelling medium we know today that more games have adapted what I presume to be in line with Echo's ethos going into this project. And in fact, many developers were well already on their way toward that end, but the collective didn't really get the memo. He was also pretty salty about the reception, having some choice words for critics. He described gamers as the guys who got wedgies in high school and divas with a predisposition to have a bug up their ass about anything urban. Inflammatory takes aside, it's more than apparent the guy had passion for the project. In a 2009 interview, Echo lamented the end result and outright said he wants another crack at this property. Getting up was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, he said. Atari shit the bed, you know? And I'm gonna fucking make that game again if it kills me. I'm gonna do it. I wanna see the brand out there again. And again, I think he has a point. We've got the flashy, cell shaded highly stylized Jet Set Radio series and its soon-to-be-released successor Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. Graffiti plays a central role in Infamous Second Son, and we've got a few more graffiti titles here and there, but there hasn't really been a game out there that's really representing the subculture in a dignified and authentic way. There is, however, a very cool VR game in early access right now called Graffiti Bombing, and it honestly looks great. From the trailer, it looks like you can conceptualize pieces in a black book, then take them to the wall. The spray effects look to be intuitive and precise, and I wish I had a VR setup just to check it out. 
I think at this point, this is as close to emulating the real thing that we're going to get. But who knows? Maybe Echo and Devolver Digital can link up. Devolver bought the property when Atari went bankrupt in 2013. There's definitely a studio out there willing to make a grounded and authentic game about graffiti culture. Though I suppose saying that kind of telegraphs my reception to the game, so let's just get into it already. Getting Up puts you in the shoes of Colchain Crowley, better known by his writing name Train. We follow Train on his journey from a nobody toy to activist hero in the city of New Radius. The city feels like a pastiche of the most urban American cities you can think of. Lots of inspiration mainly draws from New York. Those subway stations and off-color metro cards are a dead giveaway. But someone decided that graffiti artists are the problem and are a much higher priority than violent crimes. It's sort of Orwellian in a way, and I almost feel a bit icky drawing up that overused comparison. In a way, it's kind of cute to think that in this stylized dystopia and reflection of urban American life that graffiti is the harshest regulated aspect of everyday life. The subtext becomes, well, text. Because the execution is about as subtle as a sledgehammer. We've got undercovers dressed as homeless to bust artists, heavily armored enforcement squads, and they have gun-mounted APCs to take pot shots at the street artists. It's in these aspects that some of the more ridiculous, gamey parts of the experience reveal themselves. Train is voiced by Talib Kweli, which frankly gives this game some cool points right out of the gate. In fact, this whole voice cast is top to bottom crazy with a list of recognizable names including Rosario Dawson, Diddy, Giovanni Ribisi, Charlie Murphy, Brittany Murphy, Adam West, and the RZA all phoning in their best performances likely due to shoddy script work and direction. We start the game with Train's grandma kicking him out because of his aspirations to get up and make a name for himself in a graffiti world. We start in a dirty, dingy rundown building with actual fucking garbage blocking the hallways. Game developers have a very specific ideas about urban housing and it always fucking looks like this. Mere minutes into his journey, he gets his shit rocked by a member of the Vandals of New Radius, a graph crew that is really into the dime store New York Knicks. Toy ass biatch. One of Train's first trials comes when he butts heads with the Vanner's leader Gabe in a beef so absurd it literally is just dumb enough to kick this game off. After catching a beatdown and being unceremoniously humbled, Train doubles his resolve and starts to build the skills he'll need to become the biggest graffiti artist in all of New Radius. On his way to infiltrate the Vanner lair, we see the first awesome set piece of the game. Train surfs the train avoiding obstacles while trying to tag the sides of the train while in motion. That sentence has too many trains in it. It does an excellent job creating an atmosphere of excitement and urgency with its pacing and time challenge. There are three mandatory pieces to complete, but if you're fast enough, you can also complete the three optional pieces, leaving your mark completely and totally on the train. Train eventually makes his way to the Vanner hideout and runs into Dip, one of Gabe's top lieutenants. The boss fight reminds me that dudes used to wear shirts like four times their size. What was up with that? For real, it was a weird ass time. This leads to the second set piece of the game where Train and Gabe's beef comes to a head and they decide to duke it out on a highway overpass. They're each tasked with throwing up a huge piece on a highway overpass, whoever finishes first wins. This introduces the player to wall climbing and tagging spots in tandem. The party gets broken up by the governing body CCK and they have to run. He and Gabe eventually join forces to fight what appears to be a crude exaggeration of an obese butch lesbian stereotype voiced by Andy Dick. So, you know, yikes all around. And a boss fight so ridiculous, it really signals another problem with this game. It really tries its hardest to be oh so gritty, missing the mark just to fall straight into camp. These aren't impossible concepts to marry. Grand Theft Auto does it on a regular basis. But here it feels like they thematically tried to play it straight, like they knew with all their hearts that this was going to be some poignant masterpiece while being blissfully unaware of the comedically dissonant tones they were creating. Not unlike Tommy Wiseau's The Room. Train also meets Decoy, an enigmatic graph artist who questions Train's motivations and what it is he really wants from this life he chose, planting the seeds of something bigger in his mind. It was around this point we arrive at about chapter 5 or 6 and it's where I started questioning exactly where this story was going and when it would start picking up because it felt a bit stagnant at this point. There are a few levels that feel like a waste of time and could have served the story better by being omitted. For a long time there's a distinct lack of stakes. Sure the challenges get more challenging but so what? What is Train gained and more importantly why? In a true sense of irony and comedic timing, the game started picking up like immediately as I said this to myself. A cascading set of events make up our second act. 
Train infiltrates the CTK headquarters only to learn that he's on their radar in a bad way. He's also predictably betrayed by that fuckboy Gabe, which puts him in the direct path of the chief of police that leads to a brawl that ends in the chief's manslaughter. It's a really funny moment and I don't think it was really meant to be. It seemed like it was going for that poignant moment in the film where the hero is at their lowest and has to push through to the third act resolution. Utterly ridiculous. Besides, you can't spell manslaughter without a little laughter, right? Train also discovers a secret plot surrounding the date of September 6th, the day Mayor Sung took office. The whole maniacal mayor thing is pretty hilarious. We find out that Train's father was the fall guy to a plot to murder Mayor Sung's rival so he could win the election and he played his part to a T. His reward was a bullet. Someone knows this and has been trying to expose the truth to the public. Oh, I wonder who it could possibly- it's decoy. Duh, right? Of course it is. The game needed its old and wise mentor trope fulfilled in one way or another, I guess. Well, decoy's the guy. Turns out, Train's dad was his cellmate when he did time. And for anyone who has ever read a fiction, they now know Decoy's ultimate fate. We find him under rubble and slowly dying. He tells Train his final words and it's time to move on. The mayor wants Train off the street and we get a serious case of third act villain. All the pieces are coming together and Train now knows what he has to do. The climax of the game kicks off and we get a third set piece. This is easily the marquee moment of the game. The moment that should have been in trailers. The moment that, if this were a movie, would put butts in seats. It's New Year's Eve. In his mission to expose the lies and corruption of Mayor Sung, Train sneaks his way onto the top of a massive city bridge and takes everything he's learned over the course of his journey to really, truly get up in the biggest way possible. He repels off the side of the bridge and has to fill in 10 huge pieces, spelling out, still free, bringing Echo's Air Force One stunt to mind once more all while being stalked by combat choppers with giant spotlights actively searching for him. I see the full potential of this entire game in this one moment. Everything getting up is, and every message the game attempted to convey I think is flawlessly represented in this moment. People often say, show don't tell, and for the majority of this game, they've been telling. This is the moment where they show you what it's about. It emphasizes the graffiti, easily the best aspect of the whole game, and provides a big sprawling challenge for the player. This is a whole damn show, the selling point of getting up's potential. Something about the scale of the tag, the camera work, the perfect use of music make this level a whirlwind of what makes the game work when it does work anyway. The navigation can get hairy while you're trying to avoid the spotlights on the choppers and there's no quick way to make it back to the top if you're doing a piece and had to duck out to avoid gunfire. I'm also kind of just realizing that I played this game and made this video for this moment. I have memories of watching my friend Suni play this game shortly after it came out and watching him struggle with the previous level and fighting slash sneaking his way up to this part. The YouTube gods may skewer me for this one, but I think the song is too important to this moment to not include a snippet. Between the massive scale and absolutely perfect song selection of Book of Judges by Pharaoh Monch, we get this game's most epic moment bar none and it managed to plant itself into the recesses of my memory. I have a soft spot for Rap Back by Crunchy Rock Tunes. This larger than life iconic moment does all the thematic heavy lifting for the game for anyone who hasn't been paying attention. I'd also like to briefly shout out the rest of the soundtrack. The OST was produced by RJD2. Dude's got a lot of credits to his name and this one doesn't come up often. His original tunes carry a mellow, appropriate, and just a tad spooky tone to match the drab hues and shades of New Radius. Something about the music is fun, but dripping with uneasiness, right below the surface. The soundtrack is complemented by license tracks from Talib Kweli, Eric B and Rakim, Nina Simone, Mob Deep, Fort Minor, and a bunch of other rap groups and bands of the time. Getting up isn't particularly hurting for good music. After the bridge, Train ends up on a blimp which acts as the propaganda headquarters for Sung's New Year's Eve celebration. Train changes the flyers and writes over the mayor's big mural, changing it to match the monster he really is. Alright, so after some fanfare and whatever else, this is where the game should have ended. Right here. Game over. But, oh no. Getting up is hungry and it wants more. So instead, we end up on yet another tedious fight with Shauna Ray, the mysterious third villain lady of the hour. 
She's a merc, so basic and gamey, I'm surprised her vulva isn't straight up hanging out of her pseudo s and matrix gear just to give her a little bit of personality. After a final boss fight that outstayed its welcome, Train gains legend status and from what I hear he's still floating out there till this day, righting wrongs with the power of writing shit on walls, like a vandalist Batman. That's the story, for better or worse. I understand the takeaways from the tale told, but most of the thematic notes are undercut by the campy absurdity of the piece. Train's journey basically consists of him accidentally in his way through a series of high-risk, ultimately misguided decisions that lead him to an actual cover-up involving his own father? What are the odds? The dark and gritty vibes are somewhat incongruent with the general execution. As hokey as it is, I suppose it's not without its own charm. The fact that the collective worked with and actually featured real legendary street artists show they at least tried to capture some modicum of authenticity. I think that's enough about that, it's time to move on to how we play this monster. Right away, you can see that there's this old school, low res sort of charm to the menus. There's a bit of pixelation and muddy coloring. Even with the jump from CD to DVD formats, devs likely had to squeeze every bit of compression they could into the game just to get everything optimized and working within size limitations. It's kind of nostalgic in a way. Contents under pressure is kind of a mess. Actually, no, that might be a bit harsh. There are a lot of great ideas in the gameplay, but not much of it is particularly accomplished or make it stand out among its contemporaries. In a way, it's like a scrapbook amalgamation of much better and ambitious games of the era. The navigation and platforming is reminiscent of Prince of Persia. The general presentation is big, melodramatic, and vaguely absurd. Channeling notes of the story modes of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and also the drab urban setting of, well, drab urban settings. It also hits notes of much better in stealth action games like Splinter Cell and The Warriors. Oh, ooh, maybe I should do The Warriors one day. Might have been a better use of my time. I think I got it right on the money though. In form and function, I think the game mostly resembles Prince of Persia at the Sands of Time. Now I know what you're thinking, how could you possibly compare this low grade cult bait to one of the best games of 2003 you fucking monster? Well, they follow the same basic formula. Explore, complete puzzles and other tasks, break it up with some fighting and cutscenes and repeat. They're similar, but one outshines the other by miles. The platforming of the Sands of Time is just far superior. The controls in getting up are a detriment to platforming. Things don't come together smoothly and you have moments where you, for example, get stuck on a damn balance beam because the game decided jumping forward was too much of a task today. Sometimes the most interesting thing to happen is creating a beat on a climbable gate. The combat is also relatively simple and limited as getting up, but it manages to never feel wrong or poorly executed by providing challenge, superior mobility, and more kinetic level design in combat that rarely overstays its welcome. Three things the collective didn't seem to understand while making this game. I had somewhat of a hard time getting a grasp on the true controls while playing the PC port with my controller. Getting the thing to work in the first place was another challenge in and of itself. Older games and seamless controller integration don't really mix. I can't really hold that against a game from 2006, but I also can't deny that it certainly made an impression on my experience. If you're planning to play this for the first time or just retreading it, I really recommend either emulating it or playing the genuine article on PS2 or Xbox. I made it work, but obviously all the game props and controls are for keyboard controls. After comparing the PS2 and PC versions, even with configuration, the controls aren't exactly a one-to-one -one experience. Though I will say, in the end, it was worth it to play the game at a smooth, consistent 60 frames per second. Not sure if they did any upscaling or, you know, whatever it is they did, but everything just looks far cleaner and you can see it in this side-by-side -side comparison. At the same time, I'm glad I was able to pick it up for so incredibly cheap during the Steam Summer Sale, it almost makes all the trouble getting the damn thing to work worth it. It was literally $1.49, y'all. The controls are persnickety as fuck. Sometimes you won't complete certain inputs or your timing is off and it hurts navigation so much. It was something that seemed a bit better on the original console versions though, I will admit. The combat is rudimentary and every single enemy is a damage sponge from random street punks to ornery subway workers and a highly obnoxious CCK. It gets repetitive enough that you'll get sick of fighting by the third chapter, but it's all you'll ever do is the stuff that is wildly broken. And it gets worse when the guys start carrying guns. Train can crouch and hide to sneak up on enemies, and some levels even have designated hiding spots, but they're few and far between and actually quite worthless most of the time. Train can charge a sneak attack to instantly knock his enemies out by smashing them over the head with a can of spray paint. But seriously, I could cycle through my playthrough and highlight all the times it failed on me. 
The enemies have rather unpredictable fields of vision and when you get the chance to get the jump on them, whether you'll be able to execute the stealth takedown or not is a total crapshoot. And every failed attempt turns into an extended war of attrition against poorly balanced enemies. It is however a really nice touch that Train puts his hood up to indicate that he's going stealth. It's such a small thing, but it's another thing that shows me that at least some love and care was put into the detail of this game. You have a few combos at your disposal, but weapon pickups and your super meter are the real tie turners in battle. Every hit you land gains some meter and you can use it to pull off high damage special attacks. Well, relatively high damage anyway. You can also grab and throw enemies, but collision detection with the environment is highly inconsistent. Sometimes they'll bump into a wall, most times they won't. As far as I can tell, you only get one single notification for each combo input when there really should be a move list. You unlock several moves over the game and they're brushed aside pretty quickly. Seeing as this one came out in 2006, there really isn't an excuse for this. Maybe it's in the manual, maybe it's in some literature that I don't know about, but it's not great. You can also use super stuns to set up dis attacks. These attacks will fill your super meter with a cinematic attack where you can spray paint in your enemy's eyes, whack them with your roller, or really just absolutely slap the shit out of them. The combat could have used a real once over before release. Enemies tank a lot of hits and block even more. Train feels underpowered for so much of the game and the only thing it serves to do is extend the length of a game that's already slightly too long. Weapon pickups help, but not as much as their durability is extremely limited. You can also throw objects, but without an auto aim or a better throw, it's basically worthless. Overall, if the game played better, it would be a lot shorter, which is a problem. Poor gameplay artificially extending the game length is always an L. The checkpoint system is also not very forgiving. So if you screw up, chances are you'll have to start the level over. By 2006, games were implementing far better checkpoint systems, so I can't even blame the times for that one. And have we thought for like a second that maybe the CZK is actually right about this guy? I was doing some pretty screwed up shit on my journey to the top. How many skulls cracked by janky improvised deadly weapons? How many assholes thrown off a roof or a ledge to their deaths? Train is clearly a ruthless psychopath. How many poor innocent workers did we accost while they were just trying to make a living? This guy is a menace, a feckless, treacherous, unhinged menace. Are we supposed to reconcile the fact that he will straight up spray a can of paint in someone's face and light them on fire? Oh, and while we're on the subject, tell me how fire sucks too. It barely does any damage and it's more of a stun. It's fire. I saved the best aspect of gameplay for last because I felt like the game needed some kind of win. I know I've had a lot of harsh words for the game so far, but I actually don't hate it. Getting up well and truly shines when it's about the graffiti. Not the sometimes juvenile and severely underdeveloped ham-fisted plot. You literally respond to your rival by going over his piece with balls. <laughs> balls. It's also not the platforming and navigation. No, it's the graffiti. The reason why we're here. Filling out the black book and getting new tags every level is such a treat. As Train meets graffiti legends, they open up new tools and skills to use in the attempt to bomb everything. He's got it all. Glass etching markers, pre-made stickers, posters, spray cans, paint rollers, and wheat paste pieces. The first few are quick bombing tools and require no effort to use, but using spray cans for throw-out pieces enter the player into a mini game where you have to fill the outline of the piece with your spray can in order to put it up. Get used to it early because it's going to be your most common form of graffiti. An outline of the piece will appear on the wall and you simply have to fill it in to the best of your ability. There is a meter in the top right corner indicating how much spraying you can do before you have to recharge which Train automatically does by shaking a can. You can also increase the amount of paint you use by collecting cans of Montana Gold spray paint throughout each level. The game judges you based on a set of criteria including finishing before the timer ends, no drips, which accumulate when you paint over one section of the piece too long, writing or going over another tag, and the size of the piece. These all contribute to your rep meter, which affect your overall rank in the game. There are countless opportunities to gain rep on the levels with secondary and secret freeform challenges which vary from place 12 stickers on this wall to hit all these spots before the timer hits zero. Wheat paste and paint rollers have their own mini games too. The player has to use the paint roller to either roll glue or paint on the wall. Then you affix the posters for your piece or fill it in with the paint, whichever the task calls for. There's enough in the game that you might start to get sick of it, but they do their best to add some variety and you could still stick to the mission sensitive pieces and still have a pretty decent time. The biggest flaw here is that you can only choose four designs between all mediums, so you have to choose all these awesome hand styles and throw up pieces that can only use limited amount per level. Most of the time, the game will pick up all new pieces for you if you don't consult your black book.
Looking for places to bomb, required or otherwise, is what really drives the game forward and is a big part of the reason to play the game at all. At the end of this, I'm extremely torn about getting up. We've got a mediocre experience where the sum of its parts sometimes feel like less than the separate pieces. The combat and stealth feel like dead weight next to the absolute fun, if not repetitive, graffiti mechanics. I struggle to call it an outright bad game, but its blemishes are apparent and I don't feel confident recommending it to anyone who hasn't already had some kind of vague interest in it. And I get the feeling this retrospective won't tip your interest in the gotta play column. And if my marquee moment spiel wasn't enough to sell you on the potential of the game, then I've got nothing for you. I can see why Mark Echo was so unhappy with the end result. Gameplay and narrative criticisms aside, it ultimately fails to capture the essence of his vision. It's really no wonder he feels like he has unfinished business with this IP. He teased a sequel nine years ago, and as far as I can tell, has been silent on the topic ever since. If he could link up with a studio that has a thorough and proper appreciation for this little slice of counterculture, I think they could do great things. Despite its flaws, the game remains a cult classic if reception on Steam is anything to go by, and there's a decent contingent of people who want to see it remade or revitalized. I for one would love to see a version of this game developed in a modern day with a refined story and all the bells and whistles to see this concept play out the way it was meant to. The funniest part about all this? I didn't even play this game back in 2005, but it was like an itch in the back of my mind. Something that took me over 16 years to mentally go back to, and I'm kind of glad I did. All that talk, and I know I still end up somewhere in the middle when it comes to the topic of getting up. I didn't love it, but I absolutely love the execution of the graffiti. I also enjoyed the feeling it gave me in its best moments. I haven't even thought about this game for the same amount of time, but one day I got a vivid memory of that incredible set piece and now I'm here talking about it, like some kind of secondhand nostalgia. Either that, or I just wasted my time on total garbage. <laughs>